Tonight is a shir on a very fascinating and interesting topic. The topic that I'm going to speak about tonight is the entire Sefer Bereshis, or come to its plimius, which means its mystical understanding. That's a rather challenging endeavor. However, I hope to cover a lot of the Bereshis. But the interesting thing about it is to look at Bereshis in a completely different way. In fact, it's astounding that the exact same narrative that the uh, Torah uses to describe the upper story is the same narrative that is used to describe the hidden story. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight, is the hidden story of Bracious. What I'm going to do is take a look. I'm, I'm, I assume everybody here is familiar with Bracious, at least on the story level, all the different stories. What I'm going to try to do is go through Bracious and ask different questions. And then I'm going to go back and try to answer them. And uh, in certain ways, that's, uh, that's uh, a certain kind of dramatic effect. And we'll see that it's really very difficult to understand, even on a surface level, uh, the Chumash itself. The Chumash is a very difficult limud, which means uh, study in and of itself. Let's take a look. First question I want to ask, who was Adam Horishan? We know that the Medrash says that God made an agreement with the creation and he said that if Yisrael would receive the Torah, would accept the Torah, mutav, it's good. If they don't accept the Torah, then the Russian will restore the world to what is called Toyo Vavoyo. If that's the case, why is it that Yisrael appears 2,000 years after the creation? Avram Avinu was uh, 52 years old when the world turned 2,000, and it was around that time that God made an agreement with him. He was the first Jew. So if the purpose of creation <coughs> fundamentally is that the Jews should accept the Torah, how do we understand the fact that Avraham Avinu came 2,000 years after creation? Not only that, but if we ask ourselves when was the Torah given, the Torah was given 2,448 years after creation. Just think of it. Imagine the entire world has to last, according to the Gemara, 6,000 years. We are now in 5,760. So could you imagine that more than one-third of the world's time passed before the Rabbanu Shalom gave the Torah? How do we understand this? It's amazing. So that's the first question. Who is Adam? And if it has to be because of Israel, why would they receive the Torah 2,448 years later? And why would the first Jew appear 2,000 years later? Okay, let's go further. Now there's a great deal which obviously I have to leave out. I think it would be fascinating to have an entire series of the, of the Bracious at a different level of understanding. However, what I'm doing basically is what's called a, an overview of that story. Next, uh, next thing I'd like to deal with is the concept of Cain and Hevel. Cain and Hevel, of course, are the two children of Odom and Chava. And the Russian, we have a unique story where Cain kills Hevel and so on. What is the understanding really of that story? Not only that, we have the concepts of Noah, where the generation, of course, uh, was killed by the flood. How do we understand the story of Noah? and the concept of a flood. Then we have what's called a very interesting uh, segment in the Chumash, where the Moshim approaches Avram Avinu and tells him that I want to make a deal with you, I want to make an agreement with you. It's called the Brisbane Absorum, the covenant between the pieces, which is fundamentally an agreement that the Moshim makes with Avram Avinu. <clears throat> the question is, why is he making an agreement with a person? What is the nature of this agreement? What does it signify? And what does it mean that that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you? What does all this mean and what is really going on? And not only that, what is the relationship between all the other nations and the Jews and God? Then we, as we see further, we, we begin to see that it's not only Avram, but Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov. Three of us. And we know, of course, they all had wives. There was Saul, Rivka, Rochon Leah. So the question then is, what is the meaning of three of us? Why are there three of us? What does that mean, the concept of three of us? Then another question we can ask is, why, how many oimos are there? How many matriarchs are there? And the answer, of course, is that there are four. Well, something seems to be very uneven here. We have three of us. We have four imos. Why do we have that? What's the meaning of that? And why would Yaakov marry two people? 
He had more than one, two wives actually, but his, his wives consisted of, of course, Rachel and Leah. Why would Yaakov marry Rachel and another woman, Leah? Why are there four imos and three of us? What's the meaning of that? Not only that, we begin to look at a, a segment of a story, the story of Yaakov and Esau. And that kind of a story, really, I want to go into much more detail. It's a fascinating story, and it's very difficult to understand. Esau, of course, is born. He, uh, Rivka has, of course, Yaakov and Esau. And the truth is, if you look at the story of Yaakov and Esau, it is very difficult to understand this story. Let's begin to understand and see how difficult it really is. Rivka has two children, Yaakov and Esau. And the Torah tells us that even before they're born, they're fighting. They're fighting in the uterus. What are they fighting about? Esau wants to get out and worship idols. And Yaakov wants to get out and learn the base marriage. Did you ever hear embryos fighting in the uterus? to worship idols and to learn the base medrash? What does this mean? We're not talk we're talking about real people here. This isn't fantasy land or Disney World. We're talking about two people, Yaakov and Esav, and the Torah tells us that Esav wants to get out of the, the, uh, the Rechem, whatever, and he wants to worship idols. Do you imagine an embryo wants to worship idols? We know Esav is precocious, but this is absurd. The question is, where is this embryo, this infant, it's not even an infant, it's really an embryo, uh, who is Esau, where does he get his drive from? Why is he so driven? That's the first question. Not only that, if Esau, as an embryo, which itself is incredible, wants to be over the world of Zara, he's not even born yet, the question is, what free will does he have? Could you imagine somebody is a Russia as an embryo? Then what free will can this person possibly have? And if he doesn't have any free will, why do they call him a Russia? Why is he called Ace of a Russia? How could you understand that an embryo wants to worship idols before he's born? What kind of Bechira does he have? And how do you call him a Russia? It's not a Russia. It's a Nebuch. It's an Onus. That's what he is. But the Torah clearly calls him Ace of a Russia. How do we understand this? Even on simple terms. Then the Torah tells us that they're twins. What do you mean they're twins? Yaakov and Esau are twins. And you clearly see that they were identical. Because later on, when Yaakov Avinu died and they took him to Eretz Yisrael to be buried in the Morasa Machpelah, the cave of Machpelah, it said that Esau stopped the funeral procession because he wanted the place. Why should Yaakov have it? He wanted it. So there was an individual called Hushim ben Don, who was a mute, deaf mute, and he didn't hear what was going on. But he saw that this person, Esau, who he knew was his uncle, uh, that he was stopping the entire procession. So Hushim ben Don didn't know anyone's called Chochmas. He didn't, uh, you know, whatever. He figured, how in the world could you stop a funeral procession of Yaakov and Esau? Of Yaakov. So what does he do? He took his sword and he wanted to cut off the head of Esau. So he looked at him and he couldn't cut off Esau's head from the front because it looked like his, his uh, grandfather, Yaakov. Because they were identical twins. So he went to the back and just cut off his head. And the head of Esau rolls into the Moros HaMachpelah and the head of Esau, according to the Medrash, is buried with Yaakov Avinu. Do you imagine that? His body was out, but his head was with Yaakov Avinu, which really tells us a great deal. But in any case, so we see they were twins. So the question is, how could you have twins of such an incredibly different nature? This is a question. Now, another question. Yitzchak and Esau. It says that Yitzchak loved Esau and Rivka loved Yaakov. Why? Why would Yitzchak love Esau more than Yaakov? How do we understand this? So we're talking about Yitzchak, he's an Ov. He's an incredible patriarch. How is it possible that Yitzchak loves Esau more than, than Yaakov? And not only that, but we know, of course, that Esau fooled Yitzchak. So didn't Yitzchak see through this? I mean, where was, he, where was Yitzchak vis-a-vis -vis his son? So that's the question. <clears throat> not only that, we begin to, the Torah describes them very interesting, where it calls Esau an Ish Sadeh, a man of the field, and Yaakov calls it uh, Yoshiva Holom, a man, a dweller of tents. Uh, what is the Torah doing? Is it describing some kind of tendency of these, of these Yaakov and Esau in terms of what it would like to do? Or is it something else that Torah is telling us in terms of its premius? 
Then we come to the story that they're both 13 years old, actually they're 15 years old, and on that day, Yaakov Avinu is, uh, Yitzchak was sitting shiva because Avram Avinu died on that day. So Yaakov is uh, sitting, uh, Yitzchak is sitting shiva. And Yaakov is preparing a meal, it's called the Sudas Avro, it's a meal for the mourners, which Yitzchak was a mourner. In comes Esau and he's famished. He's hungry, right? Comes and sits down, and Yaakov Avinu immediately sees an incredible opportunity. He is going to take the birthright the firstborn birthright of Esau for himself. And that's exactly what he does. He says, do you want beans or you want the lentils? Fine, I'll give it to you, but let's make a deal. I want your birthright, right? And what was the birthright? What the birthright was is that in those days in the family, in the family uh, of any family, the spiritual rights to the family, what's called the priesthood, went to the Bechor, went to the firstborn. So in essence, what, Yitz, what Yaakov wanted is he wanted to buy the birthright, the spiritual responsibilities of the family. So he made a deal with him. He said, you want it? Birthright for beans. So Asaph says, fine, no problem. Asaph couldn't care less. But the incredible thing is, what is this? Did you ever hear of a brother making a deal with another brother when he's starving? No, 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 Yaakovinu is Yaakovinu. I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking to the greatest of the others, correct? The greatest of the others. Where's the chesed of Yaakov? Would anybody here have made a deal with his brother or sister and said, you want something to eat? Pay. Where's the chesed of Yaakov? Why did he do it? And it's very strange, the Lushen of Yaakov, because Yaakov says, Michro kayoim, sell me as this day as Bechay Roscho, your, your birthright to me. What do you sell me as this day? Sell me your birthright. What do you mean sell me today your birthright? What is this? What's going on here? That's the question. Then we jump to the story, of course, of the great deception, where Yaakov wants the brachas. So Rivka puts up Yaakov, of course, to deceive Yitzchak. And they put on a whole uh, lambskin or whatever it is. And, of course, uh, Yaakov comes in front of Yitzchak. And Yitzchak, of course, is blind and he doesn't see. And Yaakov, of course, takes the brachas. The question is, what's going on here? What's this rush to get the brachas? Why should Yaakov go so far as to deceive his father in order to get the blessings that Yitzchak wanted to give? What's the urgency here? This is the question. And not only that, this urgency demanded deception. Why did you have to really have the concept of deception? And not only that, when you take a look at the brachas, you see clearly that the blessings that Yitzchak wanted to give Esau, because that's who he thought he was giving it to, are material blessings. Where you will eat from the fat of the land, it's basically material blessings. It's not spiritual blessings. So what's the rush here for the blessings? For the brachas. This is the question. Also we find that later on when Yaakov leaves, and in comes Yitzchak, in comes Esau, and Esau says, uh, Yitzchak says to, to Esau, who are you? Because he asked him for blessings. He says, who are you? I just gave them. Supposedly to who? To Esau, who of course was Yaakov. So of course Esau says, what do you mean? And he starts crying. Uh, so it says that when Yitzchak realized who he really gave the blessings to, it says, He shook with an unbelievable fear. This is what it says. I want to ask you something. If somebody, if somebody just made a fool out of you, right? He just deceived you, right? What would you, what was, what's the correct emotion that you would have? What would you be? Would you, would you be frightened? No, you'd be incredibly angry. Because you'd just be made a fool of. Somebody came in and took your blessings. And of that you wanted to give. It's incredible. This is keep it over aim. What is this? But it doesn't say that's what Yitzchak's emotion was. The emotion of Yitzchak was unbelievable fear. It says, A great fear. Which means unbelievable. Why? Why wasn't Yitzchak fuming at Yaakov? Completely inappropriate emotion. So that's very difficult to understand. Then it says that Yaakov, it says, Vayetzi Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva, which means that he went out from Be'er Sheva, where, is where Yitzchak lived, and of course he went to Choron. Uh, so because of the, what's called the juxtaposition of the two psukim, the Slichus, so we learn that why did Yaakov go to Choron? Because of what happened in Be'er Sheva. 
What happened in Be'er Sheva that he went to Haran? Is it because he was afraid that Esau would kill him? And therefore Rivka told him? Is it because, because he wanted to get a Shidduch? Is that why? Or is there some other idea of why he went to Haran? Then it says that on the way to Haran he had a dream. What's the dream? He sees, he sees a ladder, a Sudan. And he sees angels going up and down this ladder. What's this up and down the ladder? What does it signify really? Then what happens? Yaakov, of course, goes to the well and he meets Rachel, of course, and then he winds up ultimately marrying Rachel and Leah, which, of course, is unbelievable. Why does Yaakov have to marry Rachel and Leah? Is it because it just happens to be that he marries... Of course, he wanted Rachel, but since Leah was, of course, distraught at the fact that she was going to be alone and Rachel was going to marry uh, Yaakov, so therefore it came out, of course, that he married Leah because... Actually, Rochel was part of the conspiracy as to why he even married Leah. But why would he have to marry two women? This is the question. And really, it's really emphasized by the question before as to the concept of <clears throat> why is it that Rochel and Leah, why are they four immors and there are only three patriarchs? This is the question. <clears throat> Fine. Then it says a significant moment that Leah had Yehuda, and, and of course, uh, uh, Rachel gave birth to Yosef. It seems to be a very important idea in the Torah. And she says, Oy this Hashem, I praise God, forgive me, of course. And uh, Rachel says, of course, by Yosef, that God should give me another son, and so on. How do we understand the importance of Yosef and Yehuda being born? Then what do we have? It says that Yaakov, when Yosef was born, he goes over to Lavan and says, I want to get out of here. It says, Vayhi when Yaakov saw that Yosef was born, he goes over to Lavan and says, okay, I'm out of here. Now let's sit down and figure out how much you owe me. What does it have to do with Yosef being born or not? If Yaakov wants to leave after 20 years, or whatever, 22 years, so you leave. <clears throat> and so you leave. What does it have to do with the fact that Yosef was born? Because the Torah clearly makes the fact that he wants to leave clearly dependent on the fact that Yosef was born. Why? <clears throat> then what does Yaakov do? He leaves. And it says that Yaakov sends Malachim to Esav, of course, uh, to find out what the story is, because Esav is coming to greet him. Finds out Esav wants to kill him. So Yaakov offers a very compelling argument. He says, Yeshli Shovachamor, I've got oxen, <clears throat> and I've got uh, donkeys, right? And I have so on and so on. I have a lot of possessions. Fine. Then he says, in Lovin Ganti, I lived with Lovin, right? And so on. So Chazal have a drush on that. In Lovin Ganti, I lived with Lovin. Ganti is the exact same letters as Taryag, 613. Unscrambled it, it's Taryag. So what Yaakov was really saying to uh, Esau is, I lived with Lovin and I observed the 613 mitzvahs. Now, isn't that incredible? What kind of an argument? You think Esau cares? If Yaakov Ovino observed the 613 mitzvahs, he couldn't care less. <clears throat> what was the argument that Yaakov presented to Esav that would somehow protect Yaakov? He doesn't care if he observed his mitzvahs. Esav is a terrible person. He's a mighty Russia. What does he care for? Then we find that Yaakov fights the Malach. He fights an angel. What is this? I mean, it's an incredible story. A man fights an angel, goes back to get his vessels, and then he fights the angel. First of all, what's Yaakov Avinu fighting in a malach? You don't find that anywhere, that a man is fighting with a malach. Second of all, a man can't win against a malach. You talk about an awesome spiritual being. And not only that, but the malach that he was fighting is Esau's malach, the Sultan. Rashi says that this malach is Sarah Shal Right? Who is the guardian angel of Esau? The answer is the Sutton himself. Yaakov is fighting the Sutton? That's impossible. And not only that, why is the Sutton the Malach of Esau? The Sutton isn't anybody's guardian angel. He's the chief of the evil empire. Why is he the guardian angel of Esau? It should have been some lower Malach. So that's the question. Then what does he do? He meets Esau. Now, we know Esau was coming to kill him. But instead of killing him, Esau gives him a kiss. And according to Rav Shimba that was a genuine kiss. Does that sound like he's trying to kill him? 
Why did Esav change his mind? And not only that, but Esav says to Yaakov a very strange expression. He says, Yehi lecha shaloch, let that which is yours be yours. So Rashi says, what does that mean? So Esav said, let the blessings which you stole from me by deceiving Yitzhak, my father, it's yours. I admit they're yours. Why would Esav do that? It's incredible. Guy's coming to kill him. So he first kisses the man, and then he says, it's your blessings. What, are the, what, what, the Esav, what happened to Esav? He went crazy. What's going on here? It's contradictory to the whole purpose of what he was coming with 400 men. What does it all mean? Then we come to one of the most difficult questions ever asked in the Chumash. If you want to know what kind of question that is, here it is. And the truth is, I don't think anybody really has an answer. The Bali Musa try to give an answer, but it's not a real answer. It's not a shot. It's a Musa answer. The question is this. Dina. Yaakov is about to meet Esau. Now, he doesn't want Esau to marry Dina. He's going to take a look at Dina and say, hey, I want that for my wife. So what does Yaakov do? Yaakov hides her into a chest. Puts her into a chest. So he hides her from Esau. Esau, of course, does not see her because she's concealed. Then Yaakov speaks to Esau. And then Esau, ultimately, he goes his way. So a bus call, a divine voice comes out and says this. How could you have hid your daughter Dina from Esau? How could you do this? You should have let Dina be there. And maybe, who knows, Esau would have married Dina. So the Bonsham says, you didn't want to give it to Dina? She'll go to Shechem. Shechem will take her forcibly. Now let me ask you something. Imagine, imagine, you're going to meet John Gotti before he went to prison. John Gotti is the, grand, is the godfather of the mafia, right? And all of a sudden, you have a very good daughter. And you're going to meet this guy for whatever reason. And for whatever reason, you'll come with your daughter. Now, let me ask you something. You don't want John Gotti to marry your daughter, correct? Certainly not. You don't want a mafia person to marry your daughter. So you decide to do what? You take your daughter and you hide her, right? Now, let me ask you something. Would anybody have any times to you? Would anybody say, how dare you hide her from John Gotti? Let him marry the mafia, uh, uh, ma the, uh, what's called, uh, the tutti, the capi tutti, whatever. Let her, yeah, let him marry the godfather. Would anybody have a tiny view? Of course not. So what does it mean that the Rebbeinu Shem had a tiny to Yaakov? It's not to be believed. Esav is a Russian Marusha. I don't even want to go into the sins that he used to like to take. One of them, one of his favorite sins was to take other men's wives and have relations with them. It was a murdered Russia. So the fact that Yaakov, who's a tzaddik, we, we have no comprehension, wants to conceal his daughter, and the Bosh has kindness on Yaakov Avinu, on uh, Yaakov, why he didn't give it to Yasef? We don't even begin to understand that question. So the Bali Musa try to answer, and they say, no, of course, God didn't have kindness on Yaakov, why he didn't give a dinner? Of course not. But what his kindness was, that Yaakov didn't even feel bad that he couldn't even give it to dinner. That's what the Bosh had uh, complaints at. But the truth is, that that's not the Pshat. Pshat says clearly that Yaakov should have given Dina to Esau. What is the answer to that? Fine. <clears throat> then, after that, fine. Then we have the story of Yosef. And Yosef is an incredible story. It is one of the most difficult stories in Chumash to understand. And I would like to ask several questions in my quest for clarity. Yosef has dreams. What's the dreaming all about? I mean, fine, so Yosef dreams. That's nice. But these dreams are not just dreams. They are called egocentric dreams. They are dreams where Yosef is worshipped. He is bowed to by his brothers. Even by his father and mother he is bowed to. What kind of a dreams are this? That a man would have dreams which clearly indicate arrogance and what's called egocentricity where he's the center of everything. He's, he's even got Yaakov and, 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 uh, and his mother bound to him. What is this? Kind of, what lies in Yosef's mind that he's having these dreams? Fine. Not only that, but it says that Yaakov, his brothers, of course, hated him for his dreams because they looked at the man and they probably thought, what kind of dreams are these? On the contrary, he's merely trying to assert supremacy over the brothers. But it says, Yaakov Shoma Esadovo that Yaakov watched or anticipated the matter. What's going on here? Yaakov clearly had a perception which is different than what uh, the brothers had. What was it? 
Clearly Yaakov knew something that the brothers didn't. The question, of course, is <clears throat> what is that that Yaakov knew? Not only that, one of the most difficult questions to understand is why would the brothers want to kill their own brother? If what? What did he do? This guy was 17 years old. 17-year-old person. That's all he was, Yosef, right? Okay, so he had some arrogant dreams. For that, you kill the guy, right? Fine. So he used to comb us here. The Torah says, he's going nah. You know, he was a nah. So the Torah says, he used to comb us here to look pretty. Fine. You know, Masalso Basaira, whatever that means, right? Fine. So that's why you kill him? Okay, so he speaks Lush and Har about you. So for that, you kill him, right? What's going on here? What's the, what lies in the mind of the brothers that they think they're justified in killing Yosef? This is the question. Not only that, it says there are many strange things. It says that, that uh, it says in the Torah that Yosef was a Ben Zikunim. He was a child of his late age. But Rashi learned Ben Zikunim, and that's the Medrash, that he was Yosef Ben Zikunim. Yosef was taught everything that Yaakov learned. You should know, before Yaakov went to Choron, before he went to Rovan, it says that he took off 14 years to go to Yeshiva. Imagine. His mother sends him to go to Choron, right? And he takes off 14 years to go to Yeshiva. And after 14 years, then he goes to Choron to fulfill his mother's request. What, what, what is this? Do you think, let me ask you something. Do you know how old Yaakov Avinu was when he left uh, because of the situation of Esau? He was 63 years old. I'm sure that Yaakov Avinu learned Yeshiva for 63 years. So all of a sudden he became a masmid and he decided to learn another 14 years? What is this? And it also says that he taught everything he learned in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever, because that's where he went, he taught it to Yosef. But it doesn't say that he taught it to any of the other brothers. Why? That is the question. Not only that, obviously the greatest story about Yosef is this test of Fatifa's wife. Here's a woman that wants to seduce Yosef. And of course Yosef withholds the temptation. He, of course, is goiver. And, he's not, and, he, and he overcomes the temptation, the terrorist seems to give this an unusual amount of, of, of lines. What is this story of, of Yosef? Now, you'll tell me, well, wait a minute. I mean, that's tremendous. There's a woman that tries, Fatifa's wife, got him alone in the house because Fatifa went away, and she wants to seduce Yosef, fine. Right? So that's a chosh I mean, man withholds that kind of temptation, fine. But I'll tell you something. This happens to many people. Don't kid yourself. You work in Manhattan, right? The seduction is going on in Manhattan all the time. And there are many from Eden that are not tempted by, by this kind of uh, seduction. So do we, would we say that this is the akin to Fatifa's wife's seduction? Why does the Torah say such an incredible shvach on Yosef because of this Misa? There's no question that it's Sitkus. There's no doubt about that. But there seems to be an additional concept here of which we are not aware. <clears throat> Fine. Then, of course, it says that Yosef had, uh, he interpreted the dreams to the, ba to the, to the baker and to the, and to the wine uh, minister and so on. He interpreted their dreams. And, of course, Pharaoh uh, had a dream. And then they said, we know a guy who interprets dreams. And, of course, Pharaoh called him. And Yosef, of course, became grand vizier as a result of dreams. Why? Could you imagine a person interprets a dream Imagine the president of the United States. He has a dream, right? He has a dream, and uh, some guy tells him, right? Hey, I know a guy who interprets dreams. He's very good. So the president says, fine. So what does he do? Calls the guy, and he has a session, presidential session, right? And he interprets the dream, this, this whoever he was. And then the president says, you know, I really like that. I love the way you interpret my dream. In fact, I like it so much, I'm going to make you vice president. <laughs> does that make sense? Okay, what do you do to a guy? You say, fine, what's your salary? What's your fee for this, for this consultation, right? He's a dream interpreter, but listen, this is a business. What's your fee? You don't make a guy vice president of the United States because he happened to interpret your dreams. Come on, of course not. What's going on here? What's wrong with Paroi? You don't think there are other people that were vying for the job? And because they couldn't interpret the dream, they couldn't become vice president. You have an idea what Egypt was in those days? Egypt was the greatest nation on earth. And the viceroy, the Sheni Lamelech, the grand vizier, he's the second most powerful man in the world. 
Why? Because he interpreted dreams. Listen, you know, they're all fighting the United States who's president now, right? Listen, let them go to uh, dream interpretation, and whoever does will win the, will win the uh, presidency, whatever. Clearly, we don't understand what's going on here. Clearly, there's another story here of which we don't understand. Question is, what is this story? Now, the Torah doesn't reveal it, seemingly so. It just gives us a story. But when you learn the story in its simple, reasonable way, it is very difficult to comprehend what is going on here. Now, I've given a certain amount of questions, whatever that is. The truth is, there are many, many more questions. You know? But what I'd like to do is now begin the pursuit of the answer. Is it possible to have one answer that will answer all these questions? I think I've given over 40 questions. Is it possible that there's one answer that can answer everything beautifully? And the answer is yes. What kind of an answer can that be? The only kind of an answer that can answer that many questions without difficulty is an answer that's true. Is an answer that's the hidden story. And that's really what you have to go to to get the answer. Fine, if that's the case, let's see if we can begin to understand what Bereshis is all about at a completely different level. How do we begin to understand all these questions? And let me tell you something, there are many more questions, many more. What we have to understand is the, a very important idea that, and only the Rebbeinshim can do this, <clears throat> he can write a book that has different meanings in the same exact narrative. That's what the Rebbeinshim did. The real, the true understanding of the Torah is that the Torah is what's called a multi-level disclosure. On one level it discloses ideas, and that's a simple story. But then there's another level that discloses another story. And there's another level, and another level, and so on. There's almost an infinite amount of levels of disclosure or information that the Roshan does. And, th and that's really what the Torah is. The problem is that in order to go beyond the surface, one has to have certain keys or a certain framework in order to do that. That's an important beginning uh, a, a, a group of ideas to know before we get into the answer of being able to look at the Torah at a different level. How do we begin to look at the Torah? Well, the first thing we have to know is the concept called the divine plan. I will <clears throat> go through that very rapidly, <clears throat> what the divine plan is. <clears throat> one, the Rebbeinu creates the entire universe for one reason only, and the answer why he created the universe is because of the concept called Hatova. He wants to create a human being and bestow an infinite state of goodness to that human. That's the only reason why the Rebbeinu created the Bria. That's it. It's very, very, really very simple. It says in the Torah, "Lehit be achisecho," and that's why he created it to bestow an infinite state of goodness on a human. Why does the Rebbeinu want to do that? What's the motive of the motive? And the answer is, it is unknown. The Rebbeinu has never revealed to man why he wants to create man in order to bestow goodness on him. So we only know the first level of motive. We do not know anything beyond that. Second, what will be this infinite state of goodness that the Rebbeinu will give this person? And the answer is, the greatest goodness of all, which is a comprehension of the Rabbani Shalom himself, that the Rabbani Shalom will reveal to this person some aspect of the Rabbani Shalom himself, God himself, and in that disclosure that God reveals is the greatest pleasure that's comprehensible to a human being. Period. Without going into more of what that means and so on. Third idea. The Rabbani Shalom has to make a decision. Is he going to give it to a person for free, or does the person have to work for it? So what God decided, what the Bershom decided, is that a person must work for this. Therefore, <clears throat> this tremendous toiv, um, hatova, goodness, that the Bershom will give is not called a gift. It is called a reward because it will only come in consequence to effort which is expended by the person. Fourth idea, fine. So therefore, the only way you will receive this goodness is if you do what? Is if you work. That's the decision without going into why. But the question is, what does this person have to do to receive this reward? That's the question. So the version creates an avoider. He creates a task 
from man. What is the task of beautiful understanding? A very interesting idea. He says, listen, <clears throat> what is the reward? The reward is me. It means a disclosure or experiencing God himself. Therefore, what the Bhagavad does is he says, listen, I will keep it simple. I will conceal myself from man. And if man seeks me and finds me to the extent that he sought me and found me, that's exactly how much he will experience me. It means if you look after me, if you get involved in my life, I will get involved in your life. That's basically what the Muslim said. Therefore, we see a very interesting thing. Since the experiencing of God is the reward, the way to get that experience is to seek God, is to understand that God is the absolute master of creation. To the extent that you believe this, to that extent, you will actually experience that which you believe. Therefore, the Bershom says, you must bring me back into creation which I will absent myself. So God leaves creation in a certain manner of speaking, and he conceals his presence from a human being. He wants to conceal his presence from a human being. And he says, I want you to bring me back. The concept of bringing God back into creation is called tikkun. Tikkun means rect uh, rectification, restoration, or repair. What God wants is this person to repair an existential flaw in the creation. What's the existential flaw? That the presence of God is lacking from the perspective of man. Therefore, man does not see the Rebbe Shalom, which really means that he doesn't understand that the relationship between the universe or creation and God is that God is the source of all being and the universe emanates from him. Man does not see this. And it is the purpose of man, of course, to see this. And therefore, God truly re-enters creation. This is the concept called Tikkun. Therefore, God says, you, man, must be masakin the creation. You must rectify creation and bring me back. Therefore, the purpose of man is to take the creation from a state of hester, concealment, to a state of gilui, revelation. This is man's task. <clears throat> How does a person do this? How do we bring God back? And the answer is, we do mitzvahs. We have to do a command that God issues to the man, and if you do the command, God comes back. And I'm not going to go into how the, what's the mechanism behind the mitzvah that allows it to work this way. I'm putting that aside. Just what it is is that the mitzvah, if you ask, if you want to know what is the mitzvah really do, the answer is it does tikkun. What is tikkun? It brings God back into creation. That's what a mitzvah does. Period. So the task of man is tikkun. The emtsoi, the device that he uses, is called a mitzvah. Fine. This is fundamentally the divine plan. Now, what does God do? He creates a man. This man is called Odom Harishan. <clears throat> he doesn't create a Jew. He creates an Odom, a man. Why? Because the interesting thing about it, and now we begin to understand, God did not intend initially that the ones who would inherit the future world would be Jews. Not at all. It is mankind. God creates man. He gives him a mitzvah. Don't eat from that tree. And what the, kind, the, the concept is, is that if you don't eat from the tree of good and evil, right, you will bring me back. So he creates Odom Rishon. Odom is a masakin. That means Odom has the spiritual powers to bring God back. But he has to observe the mitzvah. Who is Odom? He's not Jewish. And the answer is, he's not Jewish, which is true. But God didn't intend that the Jews bring God back. God wanted man to bring God back, you see. So therefore, the first man was not Jewish. But Odom wasn't Jewish. Instead, what was Odom? Odom was a Yisrael. He was a Yisrael. Now you may say, well, wait a minute. How could somebody be a Yisrael and not be Jewish? And the answer is because there are two different concepts. The concept Yisrael, when it is applied to a person, means that he can massacre the Bria. He can rectify creation. Because he has a certain kind of soul that is connected to the upper worlds. And when he does a mitzvah, the Shefa, or the divine presence, comes down. Therefore, that man is called the Yisrael. The unique ability of a man that can bring God back as a result of his actions is called the Yisrael. A Jew is somebody who is a descendant of Avraham Avinu. A Jew is a racial term. 
A Yisrael is a spiritual term. Two different concepts. Odom was a Goy, if you want to look at it that way. He wasn't Jewish, but he was a Yisrael. So that answers the question which I asked. That God did make an agreement with man, with, with the Yisrael. It doesn't say he made it with Jews. It says he made it with Yisrael. That if Yisrael accepts the Torah, good. If they don't, I restore the creation to what? To tell you the void to chaos. Who was Israel? It wasn't Jews. It was Odom. He was Israel. <clears throat> so therefore, he made, he put Odom, and he said, Odom, don't do the sin. Therefore, Odom was Israel because he had the power of Pikun to rectify creation, to bring God back as a result of the mitzvah. And of course, uh, this was the initial setup of creation. Now you'll ask me, the second question I ask is, where was the Torah? Why was the Torah given? We see that Israel was not Avram in the beginning. It was Odom Mauritian. But what about the Torah? Where was the Torah? The Torah was given 2,448 years later. Is that true? Not true. What is the Torah really? And now we understand based on what I said. The Torah is nothing more than a mitzvah which brings God back. But who says that the Torah has to have one mitzvah or 613? Uh, the amount of device that you need to bring God back depends on the amount of what? The amount of how far God is away. For instance, if you want to dig a hole in the ground, you need a little shovel. You want to dig a foundation to a building, then you need a derrick, right? Depends on what you do. The device depends on the job. In the Mauritian's time, the amount of concealment of the divine presence was very little. Because Odom saw God. In an incomprehensible way. So all the amount, all the Torah he needed was one mitzvah. That was the Torah. But since the amount of Giloi revelation was so incredible, you didn't need 613 commandments. You only needed one. Uh, it comes out that Adam was Israel, and the Torah was that one mitzvah. That's all it was. Because the device to bring God back was sufficient with only one mitzvah. That's it. Because the Gilo is awesome. Of course, what happened? Adam sinned. And therefore things changed. So then God turns to mankind and says, Okay, you guys, the descendants of Odom, you people have to now bring me back because the job continues. And of course, since man sinned, man increased a certain presence, which I will get to, which meant that you needed more mitzvahs to bring God back. So therefore you now have to have the seven mitzvahs, seven mitzvahs as opposed to one. Now, there's something very important to understand once Odom sinned. What happened? I'm not going to go into the sin of Adam. I'm going to go into the consequences of the sin of Adam. Until Adam reached sin, before he sinned, there was a very interesting relationship between this, between Adam Rishon and this creature out there called the snake. A very interesting relationship. Who was the Nochosh, the snake? The snake, in many ways, was the manifestation in a certain form. He was the mouthpiece of the Satan. What does that mean? Because the Rosham knew that a person is not going to sin if, unless he's tempted. Therefore, he creates a being called the Satan, who is the tempter, the Eight Sahara. <clears throat> the one who is the Eight Sahara, of course, was the Nahash, the snake. Therefore, it is the job of the Eight Sahara, the Nahash or the Satan, to tempt man to sin. But it's interesting. Before that sin, man had a unique relationship with the Satan. What does that mean? What happened was, is that the Satan or the Eight Sahara was not in the body of Adam Mauritian. Not at all. The Satan was an, as an individual, a creature, outside the goof of Adam. You see. So therefore the Satan could not tempt man internally, which is what he does to us. He had to offer Adam Mauritian an argument externally. And he offered him certain arguments without going into that. Therefore, the relationship between evil and man was that evil was not in the body of man. It was external to the body of man. Very important distinction. <clears throat> not only that, but the area that man lived, his circumstances, was an area that had no evil in it. Therefore, there was no, as we will see, Adam was able to live forever. The Rosham turns to Adam before, of course, the snake, and he says to Adam, man, if you sin and eat from that tree, on that day you will die. What does it mean you will die? Is that a punishment? And the answer is no. It is not a punishment at all. What was it? What happened is, is the Rosham said, you see that guy, the snake? Don't listen to that individual. Don't buy his argument. If you don't buy it, what happens? 
then that snake will go away, and what happens as a result, I will return. In other words, the task of Adam was called his Pashtis Kedusha, to restore the holiness of God into the universe. That was the task of Adam Marishim. There was, that was the only task. The problem, the, the, the deficiency of the universe was that the God was absent from creation, so the only job was to bring him back. Had Adam not listened to the Satan, the snake, then God would have re-ended creation. That would have been the Tikkun. Adam Rishon would have been the Mashiach, and the world would be completely different. <coughs> what did Adam do? Instead of doing that, not listening, Adam listened. So what he did is he changed the fabric of creation. What happened was, is that since he bought the argument of the Satan, the Satan entered the physical universe into the body of man. Now, what does that mean? That means the Satan was given dominion over the physical body of man. What does that mean exactly? That means that since Adam gave credibility to the Satan, he believed him, so God said, me the connect me the. You gave him credibility, you gave him existence, so to speak, you're not going to have to live with him in the same goof. What does that mean? That means that the Satan now inhabits the physical body. But how? He's not there. But he inhabits it through a certain extension of himself called Zoyama. Zoya means pollution. It is through the Zoyama or through the pollution that he actually inhabits the physical body and therefore the physical universe. How do we see this? <clears throat> well, it's very interesting. When the Satan inhabits the physical universe, the nature of the physical universe changed. In what way? Before the sin, Adam lived forever because there was no Satan in his place, in his universe. After the sin, the Satan inhabits the physical universe and therefore there's a change. There's a tremendous change in creation. What is that change? <clears throat> the Satan enters the physical universe, man becomes physical, and what happens? Death results. Why? <clears throat> what happens is, what is the nature of the Satan? The Satan is a destroyer. He's an evil being, and it is meant for him to tempt man. What is the nature of that which is evil? The definition of evil is that which negates, interferes with a being. It's, an, it's a privation of some aspect of being. That's what an evil is. The Satan is interested in only one thing called Choben, destruction. The, the, the Satan is a demolition expert. The only thing he knows is to destroy, because that's the concept of evil. When the Satan entered the universe into the body of man, what happens? Then all of a sudden, man begins to die, because that's the concept of evil, evil in the body of man. In fact, it's interesting that physics recognizes this concept, but of course they don't know its spiritual source, its spiritual uh, understanding. The physics has a second law of thermodynamics. It's called the law of entropy. What is entropy? Entropy says that it, given any energy system, energy will always diminish. Things always go downhill. They go from organization to chaos, if you ever notice, and so on. Uh, things always break down. That's the concept of entropy. Who is responsible for taking something which is organized and in some way demolishing it, destroying it, degrading it, and so on, and the answer is, that is the influence of the Zoyama, of the Satan, into the Bria. Uh, so the law of entropy, which physics recognizes as a second law of thermodynamics, is the concept of the Zoyama, the Satan, his influence into creation. You can look at the Zoyama, actually, pollution as a tentacle. It's like an octopus. He can reach very far away with a tentacle. The Satan, his connection with the physical universe is through the Zoyama. Fine. And in that, he inhabits the physical universe. Therefore, death ensues. So that's what the Bansham said. If you sin, you're going to die. Why? Because you will have let the Satan into your residence. And since the Satan's essence is destruction, you will begin to be destroyed. You will deteriorate. You will decompose. You will die. And death is the ultimate destruction or a degradation and so on. And that's really what the Bansham said. What happened as a result? An incredible thing. We now have two ideas. We now have the fact that what? Adam Rish now has two jobs. In the beginning, his job was merely to bring God back. But now that the Satan is here, first he's got to kick out the Satan and then bring God back. You know what it's like? It's like a guy moved into a house, right? So what does he want to do? He wants to decorate. 
So what does he have to do first? First he's got to clean the house. You don't decorate. You don't put the design uh, furniture all around if, there's the, if the former tenants have their old furniture. First you've got to throw the old stuff out and then you bring in the new stuff. Same concept. Before, Odomishim was in a beautiful house that was empty. His job was to bring God back. That's called his Pashtis Kedusha, which means the expansion or the proliferation of holiness. But after the sin, he, uh, Odom changed the, what's called the fabric of the Bria. He introduced the Sutton into his resonance. So therefore, the place became Fashmutz, which means become filthy with the Zoyama of the Sutton. Now Odom has a second job, or actually it's his first. First, he's got to clean up. He becomes a garbage collector, and then he can bring the devotion back. So therefore, the second job of man became what's called Piyasura, to subdue evil on the holiness. So therefore, Odom Horishon created two jobs because of his sin. There is now Kfir Surah, there is now the concept of removing evil. We've got to get the Zoyama out of the body. And the second job is to bring God back. But how do you do it? It's the same concept. If you withstand the temptations of the Satan, you weaken him. Now the question is, what does that mean? How do we throw the Satan out of the body? Right? He's an incredible Malach. And the answer is a very important idea. The Rav Hashem changed the relationship that man and the Sultan have with each other. What does that mean? How does God create things? God sends forth an incredible force. It's called a divine force. It's called a Shefa, a divine force. Now that force creates and maintains the existence of everything. Now, this is what it does. It's like everybody's connected to God through a cable. In fact, if God were to cut that cable, you would instantly annihilate because there's nothing creating and maintaining your existence. Everybody's got to be hooked into the Rabbana Shalom, sort of like through a cable to exist. Fine. Now, the Satan was also connected to God through his own cable. Everybody has to be connected to God to receive this divine force. So what did the Rabbana Shalom do? Because Adam now has a new job, which means to get rid of the Satan Zayma first, and then bring God back. <clears throat> the Rosh walked over to the Sultan, takes the cable of the Sultan, and he cuts it. And the Sultan, of course, is choking because he's not getting any Kedusha. Takes the cable and he hooks it into the cable of Adam Rishon. Do you believe this? And not only that, but there's a certain amount of Kedusha that comes down that can only go to one side. And that's it. Which means that the relationship between both sides is what's called survival. Because there's only enough Kedusha that comes down that only one side can survive. The question is, what determines the flow? And the answer is the acts of Odom Arishan. If Odom does a mitzvah, then he gets the Shefa. He gets this divine force. What happens to the Sutton? The Sutton grows weak and he has to walk on crutches. If Adam does more mitzvahs, then the Satan grows weaker, and ultimately you can kill the Satan by doing mitzvahs because it denies him the flow of holiness. What happens if Adam does a sin? Then the flow goes toward the Satan, and Adam begins to change. But the Satan grows incredibly powerful. What is the power of the Satan? The power of the Satan is that his Zoyama intensifies in the physical body. So therefore, the way to get rid of the Zoyama the tentacle that the Sultan has over the physical universe. And therefore the way to get rid of the strength of the Sultan is by depriving him of his meal. And his meal is Odomorishan's holiness. This is called the unique of the Sultan. That the Sultan is unique. The Sultan nourishes off the Kedusha of Odomorishan. Fine. Therefore Odom, he's a Masakin, he can bring God back. But even more so, because now he has to get rid of the Satan. So therefore what God did is he tied the, 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 the ability of the Satan to survive to Adam Rishon. So it is possible for Adam Rishon to kill the Satan, literally, by denying him what's called this divine flow. Therefore it weakens the Zayama, it weakens the hold that the Satan has on the physical universe, and ultimately the Satan dies. It's a very important relationship that man has with the Satan. Fine. So therefore, Odom we now understand is Israel. He has the Torah, and he's now got to do two jobs of tikkun. There are two tikkunim. One is to reduce the Zoyama and to kill the Satan, and then to bring God back. Fine. Now, there's one more idea that we see. What is the meaning of Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David? Why are there two messiahs? The Gemara tells us that there are two Mashiachs. There's Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. 
What do you need two people for? And the answer is a very important idea because the concept of Mashiach ben Yosef is a person that comes first and he does battle with the Sultan. There are two jobs that Adam Rishon created as a result of a sin. The cleanup campaign, right? And then the design of bringing God back. Therefore, there are two individuals assigned to these two tasks. The Mashiach ben Yosef is occupied in the, can in, in the concept called cleanup, removing the Sayama, and the Mashiach ben David is the one who brings God back. Two different jobs, and therefore there is a two different people. In other words, the sin of Adam created the necessity for a second Mashiach called the Mashiach ben Yosef. Fine. Now let us move to the Chomash. We now have enough information and framework where we can begin to understand. Who is the next people we encounter? Cain and Hevel. Why two people? And the answer is because we now see that what's the avoider of man? Two jobs. One is to remove the Zoyama, right? To do battle with the Satan. To withstand the temptations of the Satan. That's one job. And the second job is to bring God back. All of a sudden you have Cain and Hevel. Why two? Because each one had that job. The job of Cain, the Rabbani Shem says, is an over Adama, a man who has to work the earth. What does that really mean? He's the one who has to withstand the temptations of the Satan and therefore destroy him. And that's why the Rabbani Shem says, ah, the Rabbani Shem says to him uh, that Chatos, the Pesach Chatos revates, sin lies at the door, your door, right? And it wants to, it wants to, and, and therefore the utter timsel boy. But you can overcome this. What is the Bosham saying? He's saying that your job is to remove the Zoyama. And that's over that Doma to work out the earth, to remove the pollution that the Sultan has in it. And therefore to purify Gashmius without Zoyama. And then Kevel's job is to bring back the flock, because he's a shepherd, to bring God back. That's really the meaning of these two people, because both of them had two different assignments. One was in the Indian of what's called Ben Yosef, which is to fight the Satan and destroy him, and the other was in the Indian of Ben David, which is to bring God back. Of course, what did Cain do? Cain wound up killing Hevel, which of course strengthened enormously the Satan. Uh, and then the Chumash continues. Remember what the essential cosmic battle is. Of course it exists in man. But the true battle is that the task of man in those days is to destroy the Satan by weakening him, by taking the holiness away from the Satan, reducing the amount of Zoyama, destroying the Satan, and then God comes back into the Bria. Fine. Man seeks to do this for 2,000 years. What does that mean? That means that man should have done this. Because in the beginning, for 2,000 years, God said to Adam, I'm now going to give you a job to all mankind. All mankind was really Israel. And their job was to do the Sheva Mitzvahs. And had they done that, they would have weakened the Sultan, destroyed him, and the Russian would have come back. They didn't do it. So first God destroyed them through the marble. And the second thing what he did is he spread them all over the planet. <clears throat> but the Roshim saw that they are not going to do it. So the Roshim decided that they are not going to do the Tikkun. I'm going to make a deal of an agreement with the only one doing the Tikkun. Who is that? Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu is the only one observing and listening to the Roshim. Therefore the Roshim says, I am now going to give the concept of Yisrael to who? To Avram Avinu. Until now, it was all mankind. But I'm going to take it away from mankind and give it to Avram Avinu. So the Russian makes a brisk covenant with Avram Avinu and he says, The entire world will bless through you because you are now the only one that can destroy the Satan and can bring me back. They cannot. Therefore, all blessings of the earth, because of obviously if you destroy the Satan and you bring God back, that produces blessings. You're the only one that can do it. Therefore, the blessings of the entire earth is dependent on you, the only one that can do Tikkun. So therefore, the job of Tikkun was taken away from mankind and was given to Avram of Vinu. And therefore, the job of repair of creation became a Jewish enterprise. It was now up to the Jewish nation to do this Tikkun and it was taken away from the Goyim. Fine. So Avram of Vinu does the job and then Yitzchak and then Yaakov. What does it mean? Fine. There are certain what's called emanations, divine emanations. And each one of these people characterized certain emanations 
of God. Mm. Avram characterized the concept called chesed, kindness. Yitzhak characterized a certain divine flow called gvura, or strength, which means that he was able to withstand incredibly the temptations of the Yitzhahara. And Yaakov Avinu was the middle, which means that he would exemplify both. Now let me ask you something. And we now begin to understand what happened. So therefore, the job of Tikkun goes to Avram Avinu. Now, what happens now? So Avram does his job, Yitzhak does his job, but all of a sudden, this middle concept really is given over to two people. I will tell you something which is very difficult to believe. The truth is, I had asked you a question. How many of us are there? And you answered three. But then I asked you how many Imos are there? And you answered four, obviously. I will tell you something. There are four Imos, that's true. But do you know how many of us there really are? There's four. That's right. God wanted four of us. Because the job to do the Tikkun is really four. Because the concept of a divine emanation called Chesed is one person. The concept of another emanation called Vura is another person. But then there's a middle, and a middle, if you know, since it's a middle, has what's called two sides. The right side is Yaakov, and the left side is Esau. Esau is a patriarch. That's right. We now begin to understand something about Esau. Esau is an of. He is as great as Yaakov or Vino. That is why Esau, that is why Esau was twins with Yaakov. Because they were both in this middle section, Yaakov on the right and Esau on the left. This is the beginning of the understanding of who Esav was. Esav was supposed to be the fourth of. Therefore, this answers many, many questions. What does that mean? Let's see. The Torah really tells us this. The Torah says the following. What is the meaning of Esav? The concept of Yaakov is that Yaakov would be involved in what's called his Tashtis Kedusha. Actually, let me back up. Aroma Vino is involved with bringing holiness into creation. So he goes out and does what? And brings all kinds of gerum. Right? Gerum into, the, into his home. It says all the souls that Avram made. That's the concept of his Pashtas Kedusha, to bring holiness to the, uh, throughout the entire world. Yitzhak does not go out to the entire world. Yitzhak stays home. He couldn't even leave Israel because Yitzhak was involved with what? Fighting the Satan. So he's involved in the second job of Tikkun. Now, the next two people are also involved. Yaakov is involved with Kedusha, therefore the Torah says he's Yeshi Veholam, he's a man that dwells in tents, and Esau is involved in subduing evil. Esau's job was to go out into the world, withstand the temptations of the Satan, and therefore he's called an Ishsodeh. Now, you should know, had Esau done his job, he would have been as great as Yaakov Avinu. In fact, the Paneach Rosa, who is a commentary on the Chumash, says that the Gematria of Esau is twice the G Yaakov. Therefore, Esau, had he done his job as an Of, had he become an Of, would have been as twice as great as Yaakov of Eno. In fact, the Medrash says that had Esau not sinned, Yaakov would have had six Svatim, and Esau would have had six Svatim. And obviously, it has to be an Of. So Esau is really an Of, and that's why he's twins. Because him and Yaakov are both from the same concept called the centered Ferris. Yaakov is on the right side, Esav is on the left side. And therefore they're twins. Now, what was the job of Esav? Since Esav was a patriarch, what the Baruch did is he took the neshama of Esav, which was an unbelievable neshama, and he connected it with the root of evil. Because the neshama of a patriarch is a root soul. It is an incredibly great neshama that is a root to other souls. So he took Esau, who is a root soul, because he's an of, and he connects it to the root of evil, which is the Satan himself. So Esau had the ability to destroy the Satan at a fundamental level. In other words, Esau was connected to the Satan. Now, if that's the case, we begin to understand something. That the Yetzirah of Esau wasn't the regular Yetzirah that we have. The Yetzirah of Esau was the Satan himself, which would have meant that he had completely abnormal drives. <clears throat> Therefore, Esau is born in what way? 
we read all of a sudden that what does Esav do? Esav is involved in what? As an embryo trying to over the Sarah. What does this mean? And the answer is because the, the Yitzhar of Esav was satanic, was literally satanic, and the Torah shows you that even as an embryo, Esav is connected to the Satan, therefore the drive of Esav as an embryo is abnormal. <clears throat> That's why Esau uniquely was the only one in creation, really, that had this drive. Because it was his job to subdue the Sutton at a root level. Therefore, his Yitzhahara was a Sutton himself, not merely one of his underlings. Therefore, his drive was abnormal. So as an embryo, his drive was what? He had an incredible drive because he had to do battle with the Sutton himself. Now, you're going to ask me a question. Wait a minute. What kind of a free will did this man have? This guy is tied to the Eight Sahara because the Bosha wants Esav as a, a patriarch to destroy the Sultan, correct? So then what kind of free will does Esav have? And the answer is, let's take a look. We don't realize that Esav was an unbelievable, or he could have been an incredible tzaddik. Where do we see this? Let me ask something. Esav was a megalomaniac. He's an incredible bagaiva. Because we see that when he sold the Bechira, it says, Esav as a He despised the birthright. That's gaiva. It's arrogance. Let me ask something. For a person who's a very arrogant person, what is the most difficult mitzvah for that person to perform? And the answer is, any mitzvah which subjects you to authority. And that's the mitzvah of Kibra of Aim. Right? To honor your father and mother, really saying subjects you to the authority. But for a person who's incredibly arrogant, that's the most difficult mitzvah to observe because me listen to them? Yet it says in the Torah <clears throat> that Esau observed the mitzvah of Kibra of Aim greater than anybody. In fact, it says in the Gemara that Rabbi Shimon Gamliel says on himself that I am the greatest man in my generation to observe the mitzvah of Kibra of. Uh, that's what he says on himself. But he says in the Gemara, but I find that my uncle Esau observed it greater than I. Can you imagine? In fact, you want to have an idea what kind of kibbutz over aim Esav had? I'll tell you. It says in the Medrash that when Esav went in to see his father and mother, or his father, it says he put on his big day Shabbos to see his father. Could you imagine the honor that he accorded to Yitzchak? So this same man that has the strength to deny his megalomania to his father and observe complete submission to his father, can you imagine the power of this person if he wants to do mitzvahs? That's why Esav had incredible Bechira. Because to the extent that he was tied to the Sutton, to destroy the Sutton, he had unbelievable ability to destroy the Sutton if he wanted to. Because he had the power of an oath to do good. What did Esav do? Of course he didn't do good, he did evil. And for whatever reason he decided to go in the path of evil. That was his decision. But he could have easily destroyed the Satan. Because we see that from the concept of Kibbutz of Aim. In any case, this is what's happening. What then is the story of Esau? Esau, we understand why he's, a, why he's of course, uh, uh, why he uh, decided, why he has such a tremendous Yitzhahara, we understand, because his job as an of, a patriarch, is to destroy the Satan, and we understand why he's twins. What is really the story of Esau? Esav is the story of a patriarch and of that sin that blew it. It's, it's the same thing if you had looked, imagine if Avram Avinu decided to all of a sudden worship idols. Of course, we would be astonished, right? That's exactly what Esav did. Esav is a patriarch that could have been twice as great as Yaakov that blew it, which means he decided to go to Tabas Raw. That's really the story of Esav. Now, this is the case. What happens? Now we begin to understand. First of all, we understand why Yitzchak loved Esau. Because the job of Yitzchak was to do battle with the Sultan. As I said, Yitzchak's job was in the second job, which is to do the Tikkun of the Zoyama, to fight the Sultan as much as possible, not to spread holiness around. That was Avram's job. It comes out that Esau was in the same job as Yitzchak. That's why Yitzchak loved Esau. Because he was a fellow worker. This is why Yitzhak has such a, uh, had such a tremendous love for Esau. So what happens? Esau fails because he wants to fail. And it says that at 13 years old, he decided to throw off the yoke 
of, of, of mitzvahs and so on, but he didn't show anybody who he was. When he was 15 years old, he went out and in one day committed five terrible sins. Now the question is this, think about it. If a patriarch does a sin, it's not like we do a sin. If we sin, fine, okay. So we deny a certain amount of shefa to ourselves, holiness, and the sultan takes it. But could you imagine a patriarch sinning? Then the sultan has an unbelievable steak dinner, right? If we sin, the sultan only gets what? Peanuts as holiness. If Asaf sins, right, he's got a four inch thick steak. Because a tzaddik's amount of awe is unbelievable. When a tzaddik uh, does a mitzvah, he has incredible kavonis. So therefore, if an of sins, could you imagine the chobim, the kilkel in creation as a result? And Asaf sinned for two years as an of, as the soul of an of, he's sinning. What was the chobim he did in the Bria? I'll tell you. You know what Asaf did? What was the kilkel of Asaf? I will tell you. It says that Avram Avinu died five years before his time. Because Avram Avinu should have lived to 180. Instead, he lived to 175. Why did he die? Because he couldn't see what happened to Asaph, that Asaph, who was his grandson, went to tremendous evil. Let me ask you something. Do you know, what it, you know how many mitzvahs a tzaddik of the caliber of Avram Avinu did every day? It's incredible. Do you know how much less of Shefa how much less of Tikkun was accomplished because Avram Avinu died five years before his time? An unbelievable amount. Why did Avram Avinu die before his time? Because of Esau. So it comes out that the ultimate kukul of Esau was the death of Avram five years before his time which denied the world an unbelievable amount of Tikkun. This is what Esau did to the Bria. When you think about it, it's incredible. Now, what happens? Esau is 15 years old, and on one day, on the day that Avram Avinu died, he goes and commits these terrible sins, five sins, the Chazal say, without going into them. Now Yaakov Avinu, who is his brother and his twin, Esau comes in and he's famished. Now let's take a look at what Yaakov, Yaakov looks at Esau, and because he's an incredible person, at 15 Yaakov wasn't normal, he was an unbelievable tzaddik, Yaakov Avinu at 15, takes a look at Esau and he says, it's incredible, you killed the Zayda. You killed Avram Avinu. That's why he died today. So therefore Yaakov Avinu knew that he must take away the ability of Esau to do Tikkun as an off. Because remember, if you could do Tikkun rectification, you could do Kilkel destruction. Whoever, that's because always side by side. So Yaakov Avinu said, I must take away the ability of Esau to do this Kilkel. I must diminish him to take away his avaus, his ability as a patriarch to do tikkun, or else to destroy the entire creation. So Yaakov Vinu says to him, Michra, sell me kehayoyim, as this day. It means this day, which is the day that Avram Avinu died, we see what your kilkel did, that I must take it away from you. Therefore, I will sell you beans, lentils, give it to me. So we ask, what is the chesed? We see immediately, Yaakov had to take away the ability of Esau to do the Tikkun, therefore taking away the ability of Esau to do the Kilkum. He had to take away this unbelievable Neshama, or Esau would destroy the creation, because that's what an Of can do. He can wipe out the creation. So he says, sell it to me. Buy, I, I, I want to buy it. That's what Yaakov Avinu really did, and it's rumors. It is alluded to in the word Hayoim. Sell me this day, because on this day we see what you did. You killed our grandfather. I must take away your ability to do the Tikkun, and therefore you can no longer do Kilkul. I must remove you from the whole concept of the bris, the covenant, and remove you as an off. Asaph couldn't care less, because he was way beyond that. He says, no problem. And he gives it to Yaakov Avinu. Fine. Time passes. So therefore, Esav, of course, is gone. Time passes, right? And what happens? The brachas. Yitzhak doesn't know this, that Yaakov, that Esav sold it. And as far as Yitzhak is concerned, Esav is still involved in fighting Sahara. And he knows that if somebody fights Sahara, it's very easy to fall. That's why the fact that Esav was doing sins wasn't the chiddush to Yitzhak, because he knows that somebody who's got to go into the mud to fight the sudden, of course he's going to fall sometime. But he thought, as far as he's concerned, that Esau is still doing a good job, even though he sins every once in a while. 
So Yitzchak said, I want to give the blessings, the material blessings to Esau, because the material blessings be belong to the one who's involved in the area of tikkun of destroying evil, which is the union of Ben Yosef. And therefore the blessings are gashmis. They are a material. Where it says <clears throat> that you will rule over all the nations, you will have the fat of the land. In other words, you will take all the gashmis and you will channel it to Kedusha. And that's the Indian of somebody who fights the concept of Yesen. Now, but Rivka knows that it's switched. <coughs> and therefore she says to Yaakov, at all costs, you must get those brachas. Why? Because if Yitzchak blesses Esau, he will restore the ability of Esau to do the tikkun. He will restore his ability to destroy the creation. So at all costs, you must get it, even though we have to deceive your father. <clears throat> we begin to understand the incredible urgency here. Because had he gotten it, it would have restored his ability to do tikkun, which of course in his case means the ability to do kilkel. He would have been machrev, he would have destroyed the Bria. And an off can do that. We can't because we're too little. But a patriarch can wipe out creation. That's how, that's what's called, that's how much plugged in he is into the Eris, into the upper worlds. Therefore, they, they go about this whole thing deceiving. Fine. Yitzchak Vino, of course, <coughs> gives the blessings to Yaakov, and he doesn't know it's Yaakov. He thinks it's Esau. <coughs> Yaakov leaves. So the world is saved, right? Because what Yit Yaakov prevented was the ability of the Esau to destroy creation. Now, in comes Esau and tells Yaakov, he tells Yitzchak, he says, uh, I'm here. Who are you? I'm Esau. Where's my blessings? So he, the, the Torah says, and now you understand, Vayechrad Yitzchak, and Yitzchak shook an unbelievable fear. I had asked the question, he should have been fuming mad. But no, he realized that if this is what happened, that Esau isn't somebody who's doing Tikkun, he is a Russia and he's destroying creation. So Yitzhak realized that he almost restored the power of Esau to do Kilkul, and had that happened, he would have destroyed who knows how much of creation. What would be the normal reaction? Unbelievable fear. That's why Yitzhak was afraid, because he realized he almost fell into the fact that Esau would be restored as a of. Fine. Now, if that's the case, what happens? You have three of us. Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. But there's a problem here. Because somebody has to do the job of Esau. Listen. You may remove Esau. Fine. Because he blew it. But who's going to do his job? Because there's a side in the heavenly lights that must have somebody fighting the something. Right? And that person, that person has to go in and do what Esau did. Esau went into the field. He was an Esau there. What's an Esau there? A man who goes into the field, he joins the world, he's tempted by the Sultan, and he's still a Tzaddik in what's called the Klippa. He's still a Tzaddik in unbelievable temptation. So if Esau failed, somebody else has to take up the slack. Who was that? The answer was Yaakov Vino. Yaakov took up the slack. And this is what happened was called a contingency plan. And the Moshim said, listen, you're going piggyback. Until now you did your job, fine. To spread holiness by learning Torah. Uh-uh, now you got to do Esau's jobs. I need somebody to pitch in for me. So Yaakov took over the job of Esau, especially since he got the blessings of Esau. Ah, Yaakov takes over the job of Esau. So what does Yaakov have to do? Yaakov has to become an Ishsodeh. He's got to go to the house of Lovan, which is the murder of Russia, and he has to withstand the sun. You see? So Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva, Why did he go to Choron? Not because he was supposed to get married. Not because Esau was out to kill him. Because now he had to become an Ishsodeh. He had to take over the job of Esau. So he goes to the house of Lovan. So the Boshim shows him a ladder. Angels are going up and down. The Boshim was telling him there are two ways to be Oive. One is to go up, which means to spread holiness, and the other is to go down into the clipper, down into the mud of the Sutton, and you've got to destroy the Sutton. Your job was initially ascent. Now your job is descent. That's why he had the dream of angels going up and down. Fine. So he gets to Lovan. So since he now has a job of Yaakov, and now he's temporarily in Esau's corner, right? He's got to marry Esau's wife, 
future wife. Who is Leah supposed to marry? Esau. So he has to marry Leah because the wife of a person is masugal to the avoid of whatever you do. And since Leah was the co-wife or partner in that avoid of destroying the Satan, right? Uh, she, was, uh, she was unique to Esau. Since he took over Esau's job, he had to marry her. You see? You get a new job, you get a new wife. In any case, we now understand why there are four matriarchs and only three patriarchs. Because Leah should have married Esau, who was an of. But since Yaakov took over her job, therefore Leah had to marry Yaakov. And that the whole thing came about to a kanunya, to a whatever and so on, in order for Yaakov to marry Esau's wife. Because he now had a spiritual endeavor of Esau, you've got to marry his wife. Fine. Now, but Yaakov Avinu cannot do this job very long. I mean, how long can he do Esav's job? Because Esav had a job of fighting the Sutton. Therefore, the Sutton to Esav was what? Was Taiva. Yaakov's Yetzirah wasn't Taiva. It was what's called Anivis or Gaiva. Because Yaakov Avinu had to contend with arrogance or humility that, and so on. Whereas Esav's specific kind of... Um, uh, Satan was really in the area of Taiva. So Yaakov Avinu couldn't do it all the time. So at a certain point of time, Yaakov would have to drop the job of Esau. When does he job, drop the job of Esau? How can he do it? There's got to be somebody else. Because Yaakov Avinu only did half the job of Esau. What about the other half? So the Russian did an incredible thing. Another contingency. He had to take a Shevet, a tribe and elevate him to be the status of half an of, chazi of. So this individual has to have the neshama of an of, so he can take over half the job of Esav, and the other half is a shevet. Who is the only one that could do that is Yosef. The secret of Yosef is that Yosef took over the second half of the job of Esav, you see. Therefore, Yaakov and Yosef do the job of Esau. That's why it says, Uvahoyo base Yaakov le'esh. The house of Jacob will be for a fire. Ubeis Yosef le'hovo. And the house of Joseph will be for a flame. And therefore, Ubeis Esau the cash. They will be as straw. You need Yaakov and Esau. Now, we begin to understand. And here comes really the best parts. Let me tell you something. You can't go in the house of Lovin if you're not prepared. So Yaakov Avinu says to himself, okay, I gotta go into this, what's called Kippa, this terrible situation where the Sutton is found. And that's what Lovin was. But I can't do this. With all the Torah I learned for 63 years, it's not enough. It's one thing to learn Torah when you're at Sadiq, but when you gotta do battle with the Sutton, you better make sure you know what you're talking about. So therefore Yaakov decides, I gotta go to Yeshiva. The yeshiva of Shem Ve'eva for the new job of fighting the Sultan. That's why Yaakov Ovinu went to the yeshiva of Shem Ve'eva for 14 years. In order to garner enough terror to fight the Sultan as well as to understand Kedush and spread it. Fine. Uh, so then Yaakov Ovinu, he knows that he's going to have a child, a Shevet, that's going to be elevated to a Chatzi of half a patriarch. So therefore, Yaakov, when Yosef is born, Yaakov Avinu goes running to Lovan. He says, I want to get out of here. It says, and it, when Yosef, Vayahi, and it was, when Rachel gave birth to Yosef, then Yaakov went over to Lovan and said, I want to go back. Why when Yosef? Because Rashi says, because now that Yosef is born, let him take over the other half. I want to go back to my place. That's why it says in the Torah, you see how the Torah is one word, a root to the whole story. So Yaakov says to Lovan, I want to go back. El Mekoimi Vilarzi. To my place and to my land. What is my place and land? I want to go back, El Arzi, to my land in Eretz Israel. Vil Mekoimi and to my place where I used to be spiritually, not on the side of Esau. Let Yosef do it. The language alludes to the whole concept. So therefore Yosef takes over the job of Esau and he's a second part. Fine. If that's the case, now what happens? <clears throat> so Yaakov, he finishes with Lovan because he did his job, the half a job of Esau. And Yosef is now going to do the rest. <clears throat> so Yaakov now goes home and all of a sudden he meets the Sutton. Why is the Sutton the angel of Esau? 
And the answer is a very important idea. Because if you're connected to an angel and you're supposed to subdue that angel, if you do, fine. If you don't, he takes you over and he becomes your malach. Since Esau was connected to the Satan himself, not to an underling, right? Because it was a, a, a root soul, patriarch, against the root of all evil, because that's the only one that could subdue the Satan. Since Esau joined the Satan, the Satan becomes his malach. Now, the Satan, however, is worried. Because Yaakov did the job, he said, he did what? He, he fought, you know, he remained righteous in the house of Lovin. Correct? So what happens? So Yaakov leaves the house of Lovin and he sends this message to Esau. He says, I'm Lovin Gauti. Yes, sure, I have an ox. Who is the ox? The ox is the sign of Mashiach ben Yosef. This he tells Esau. I did the tikkun of removing the Zoyamor to the level of patriarch. The Yeshli Chamor. Who's the Chamor? It says, the only Ruch of the Chamor, that's Mashiach ben David. I brought down the root soul of Mashiach ben Yosef, that's Yosef. And I brought down the root soul of Mashiach ben David, that's Yehuda. Yeshli Shor, the Yeshli Chamor. The Yeshli Tsoin, and I have sheep, which are the 12 tribes. I brought down all these neshamas because I succeeded in doing at the level of a patriarch the incredible tikkun on both sides. And that's what he says, in loving Gauti, I lived with loving and I observed the Tariq Mitzvahs. Listen, those blessings that I stole, they're only about doing the tikkun. You're not interested in tikkun. What do you care for those blessings? That was the argument that, Lo that uh, Esau said to, uh, that Yaakov said to Esau. I observed the mitzvahs there, for I am did the job of tikkun, therefore do not hate me because I took those brachas, because they are really intended for the person that will do this tikkun. And I did it. So what complaint do you have? That's the logic of the argument of Gati. Fine. So he's now about to meet Esau. But it says, Vayiri Yaakov Ma'oid, that Yaakov was incredibly afraid. Why was he afraid? Because there was one mitzvah that Esau had that was incredible. That's Kibbut of Aim. And Yaakov Avinu did not observe Kibbut of Aim the way the other, of course, the way Esau did. Because he was gone from his house for 22 years. So Yaakov was always afraid that the midst of Kibbut of Aim that Esau had, honoring your father and mother, that Esau had, would in some way subdue him. That's why he was afraid. In any case, he's about to meet Esau. But before he meets Esau, he meets the Malach. Why? Because the Sultan says, uh-uh, you didn't finish your job of Esau. What's your job? Your unique position is you have to fight against arrogance. So it says in the Torah, a very strange story. It says Esau, the Malach of Esau, which is a Sultan, and now you know why the Sultan is the Malach of Esau, because that's who he had to subdue, and he failed, therefore it becomes his Malach. The Sultan, the, 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 the angel of death himself, he says, Yaakov, you've got one more test before I let you go. So it says in the Torah, and a man fought with him. What do you mean a man fought with him? It's a malach. Because what happened was, is it wasn't a battle. He didn't fight an angel. What he fought was the Satan as the eighth horror. What happened is the Satan entered his mind and said to him, Wow, you're an incredible person. You just did the tikkun. You've got Klai Yisrael. You have the root soul of Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Zoyed, ben Yosef. Wow, are you a fabulous person? Because he wanted to try to get Yaakov to be Gaiva. But the interesting thing is that since the Satan was the one in his mind, the Torah calls him an Ish because when the, when the Satan when the Satan appears to you as a Yitzhahari, he's called an Ish because he's in you. Therefore, he comes as an Ish. But the thing is, it wasn't a mild temptation to be arrogant. It was a satanic level temptation. It means Yaakov Inu sat the whole night trying to fight his gaiva. That's what he was doing. And in the, at the end of the night, it's interesting. I don't want to go too much into it because it's a great deal more to say, which I have to leave out. It says that Yaakov fell slightly. It means he had a certain gaiva, slight. And because of that, the Sultan was able to hit him in the side. Because he opened himself up because he, there was a slight sin. And the Medrash says this. Slight gaiva. And that was the opening for the Sultan to hit him right by his hip. But I'm not going to go into that. But in any case, 99% Yaakov stood by the temptation of evil as given by the Sultan. Not an underling. And he won. And that's what it says. He was complete. 
He had brought down all the neshamas of Klai Yisrael, the shvatim, the meshichan, right? And he had done this incredible job. Fine. And now he meets Esau. Now, what did Yaakov do? He hides Dina. What are you doing? Remember the question I said? It's probably the most single greatest question in the entire Because what's the answer to that? You mean if I don't marry my daughter to Carlo Gambino, he's a mafioso too. And John Gotti, you have tarumas to me? So what, what does this mean? Listen what the Rebbe wanted. Again, based on the hidden story. Listen the way it works. And you, not, only, not only will you not have a question, you will agree with the Rebbe That's how much you see what the answer is. Listen to this. The Sultan has to get Yaakov at his level, which is satanic, the temptation of a Sultan. Fine. So Yaakov withstands. What did Yaakov Avinu do? He subdued the Sultan. Who is the Sultan? The Sultan is the Malach of Esau. They're still connected. Now let me ask something. Do you know that if somebody walks over to your guardian angel, and everybody has this, it's called the Mazel, and I overcome him, do you know that you are incredibly changed? Because he's connected to you. In some way, it alters you. If Yaakov of Venus subdued the Sultan, which is the angel of Esau, what did he do? He weakened the ability of the Sultan to influence Esau. <coughs> Therefore, it was possible for Esau to do tshuva. Because if you, if you weaken the Sultan, the angel of Esau, he's Yitzhahara, uh, so he can do tshuva. That's incredible. Esau could have done tshuva. But what do you need? What does Esau need to do tshuva? He needs a good woman. Who is that good woman? Dina. <clears throat> right? Who was Dina? Think about it. Who was Dina really? It says Leah had six kids and she was about to have a seventh. And that child was Yosef. She was going to have Yosef. So either she or Rocha prayed and that child who was Yosef changed into a girl. Who was that girl? Dina. So Dina is a female Yosef. Which means that she has the ability to fight the Sultan. Because Yosef has the ability, which I said, to fight the Sultan. So Dina is a female Yosef. Now what a shidduch, right? A female Yosef marries Esau, who used to be the major guy that Yosef took over. Could you imagine? What a shidduch. So what would have happened? <clears throat> Dina would have married Esau, right? And Dina would have restored Esau to Klai Israel because his malach was weakened. So between a weakened malach and Dina, he would have done tshuva. What would that have meant? Esau would have become what? He would have gone back into Klai Israel. So therefore, for 2,000 years, we suffered at the hands of Esau. All of this would have been gone because Esau would have been a Jew. Not only that, imagine what Yitzchak would have done. What kind of a simcha Yitzchak would have done had Esau restored because Yitzchak loved Esau. That would have been an unbelievable kibber of aim that Yaakov would have done to Yitzchak by bringing back Esau. And not only that, imagine, instead of Dino being taken forcibly by Shem, who did they have? They had Osnas, who eventually married Yosef. Because she was the one that was brought to Egypt, and Yosef married her. So Osnas would have been the daughter of Esau and, and Dino, and Yosef would have married Osnas. Esau would have been the father-in-law of Yosef. What a switch! And this is what the Bershom says, how could you do this? He's ready to do tshuva, just give him Dino, because he's Malach. Now you're going to say to me, how is Yaakov supposed to know this? He can't read God's mind? And I'll tell you, because first of all, he should have understood that if he subdued the Esau, he subdued the Malach of Esau. Of Esau. But there's something else. Do you remember what I said? The Esau came to kill him. Didn't he?